All right, hey guys, welcome back to my YouTube channel. So, um, of course, as usual, I'm sorry for the late drop. I've been working on it, I swear. But today I'll be helping you guys with the, you know, a bit of a preparation for your chemistry exam tomorrow, which is also my chemistry exam tomorrow. So um, Lord be with us. All right, so what I'll do today is um, actually go through modules one, module one, module two. I haven't found any questions on gravimetric analysis. So if you find any, just send them over here to me on Instagram or on app at 876-501-1966. And I'll see what I can do. Um, yes yeah, so do that and i haven't gone through ammonia yet so i'll be basically showing you my little powerpoint as well that i did ammonia my presentation and on ammonia on and we'll go through the ammonia questions that i found and the ethanol questions it's going to be quite a lengthy time so um take a nap if you need to in between i guess and um get food <laughs> you're probably going hungry so let me just get started seeing that we have a long way going and i can see the chat by the way so you can always talk up there i guess um let's get to it um i'm mad tired all right, let's see. Can I join my own life? Yes, I can. And if you have a friend that's, you have a friend that, you know, you know they're doing chemistry tomorrow and they probably will benefit from this, hit them up right now and tell them to come over. All right. So let me start, share the link. Let me just clap it on WhatsApp real quick. For my friends. <sighs> All right. So the first question. All right. Alanine, that's an amino acid. Two amino propanoic acid to be exact is one of the 20 naturally occurring amino acids. Now, it is a white solid which exhibits isomerism. So no, it's displayed formula is shown right here, right here. That's a terrible arrow. And the first question wants us to define each of the following terms, stereoisomerism and chiral center. No, stereoisomerism is an occurrence where um, a compound or a molecule has the same molecular formula. However, the bonding is the bonding in space is different. So they'll have um, a different structural formula. And for stereoisomerism, that would be with regards to its bonding in space. All right. So same molecular formula, different structural. All right. Now the chiral center. The chiral center is a atom where, which is bonded to four, four distinct or unique atoms or groups, all right? So it's bonded to four distinct, four unique, whichever word you feel like, atoms or groups. So here it's number two wants us to copy the displayed formula of alanine and in, in your answer booklet. So, you know, whatever paper CXC planning on giving us tomorrow and place an asterisk to identify the chiral center and state the type of isomerism exhibited. Now, you need to look for, in this case, the atom or here it's going to be a carbon atom 
that has four unique or distinct groups or an atom or different atoms bonded to it. All right. So here we have carboxylic acid group here. Here we have a CH3 group. Here we have a single hydrogen. And here we have the amine group. So the chiral center and here the, car the chiral carbon would be right here, the one right here. Now, if you're going to answer this question, all you had to, all you'd have to do is draw this thing here that they have up here, the compound, the displayed formula that they have you have up here, and just put an asterisk beside that carbon. Um, I didn't draw it over because I'm kind of lazy. <laughs> But that's how you'd go about answering that question. Now, here we have A and B are, oh, I think I forgot one part of this. Um, the state, the type of isomerism exhibited, it's optical isomerism, right? And whenever we say a compound is optically active, we just mean that the compound has the ability to polarize light or have it rotate rotate, whether that be left, right, up, down. Can I say up, down? I don't care. Just rotate, all right? So once it has the ability to rotate polarized light, it's optically active. So that's an optical isomer. And you can identify that by a chiral center. Now, here we have a question from the 2010 paper, paper two. You know, A and B are structural isomers, and they have that long thing right there that I'm not very happy to see. But we're going to the question anyways. Explain why A and B are structural isomers. Now, before we just discussed, we just discussed, um, what was it? Stereoisomerism, yeah. So we discussed stereoisomerism and we said that that's where we have the compound having the same molecular formula or formula or formula, it's formula, yeah. And a different structural formula as per how it is bonded in space. However, for a structural isomer, of course, it's the same molecular formula as well, but this time the difference in structural formula is brought about by its bond sequence or bond order. So basically the order in which the atoms are put in, you know, place. So that's why, that's how you would explain why A and B are structural isomers. They have the same molecular formula. However, the difference lies in their structural, for, you know, for many of you who know me, I know I can't spell, so <laughs> that's another thing. So structural formula in, um, based on, Bond order slash sequence. All right. Now, name two functional groups present in both molecules. Now, I see an OH, OH, and double bond, double bond. There's also single bonds, but let's not go there. So the functional groups, um, hydroxyl, and the alkenyl, the alkenyl. No, this represents alcohols and alkenes. Now, please um, pay attention to this. This is what the functional group is called, right? Hydroxyl, alkenyl. Alcohols, alkenes, alkanes, alkynes, amines, amides, those are homologous series. So each homologous series has a functional group, you know, that has a name. And the functional group for alcohols are 
the hydroxyl group or is the hydroxyl group and for alkenes it's the alkenyl group and for alkanes the functional group is the alkyl all right so remember that here says a and b also show stereoisomerism Draw the displayed formula of A and circle the chiral carbon on the molecule. Now, let's draw the structure for A. Like, first, let me see what A was. A was CH2OH. CH2OH, was it in brackets? Yes. OH. CH2CH, CH2CH, and CH3, CH2, CH2, CH3, that's a branch there, CH2, CH2, double bond, I think, was after that, or it was, no, it was CH, then CH2, the CH, then the double bond, and CHCH3, all right. Now, first, um, we're drawing the displayed formula. So they want to see all the bonds. So C H2 and bonded to this carbon in brackets, they're telling us that this OH is bonded to the first carbon. So you can put the OH, right? Beside that, you'll have another CH2. Then you'd have C1H and a methyl group bonded to that. For space purposes, I'll put the H up here and the methyl group that is bonded down here. Right? And then you want to continue. C H2, CH2, now C, one H, double bond, C, then an H, and attached to this, CH3. All right, now to identify the chiral carbon, you want to find where you have three, dis four distinct groups, right? I usually look for where the branches is the branches are or the branch is so that I can like see if then I know that there will be an there will be a hydrogen above it and then you know what beside it. So here we have the methyl group. We have hydrogen. This looks like ethanol to me. Probably it probably isn't, but who cares? Um, and then you have this long thing over here that I will not attempt to name because I don't want to embarrass myself. And anyways, here would be the, that would be your, your chiral carbon. So you just want to circle that up real nice for CXC and get your two marks. Then two wants you to draw geometrical isomers of B and suggest why B has no optical isomers, right? So first to draw, can draw B, I guess. And seeing that they didn't ask for the displayed formula, I'll just draw a normal thing for B. So B, carbon, double bond, carbon, H, H, and I think CH2, OH. I'm not scrolling up because I'm looking at it on something else. And uh, over here, we had this long piece, CH3, CH, CH3, ranged um, C2, H4. Probably I shouldn't write it like that. CH. CH3, okay. would that be correct? 
that would be 4C2H4. All right, let's go back up. Yeah, it's fine. Now, the next one isomer that you could draw for this, and this would be the cis, this would show cis isomerism. Could draw the same thing, however, put the hydrogens um, transverse from each other, I guess, can say that, CH2OH. And over here, the same thing, CH3, CH. Can check this though and ensure that I actually drew everything because there it's easy to miss, but this would be transverse or trans, sorry. Isomerism. Thus, um, B has no optical isomers because there is no chiral carbon present, all right? So that would be that. Now, here we have the 2010 paper two as well. And this wants us to explain what is meant by the term cracking. Now, cracking is a process whereby long chain hydrocarbons. And I keep stressing this because even though it may be like, probably you think it's obvious, but not many people know, but hydrocarbons only have hydrogen and carbons. So you can never find, an, find a hydrocarbon with oxygen. So hydrocarbons only hydrogen and carbon present. So cracking is where long chain hydrocarbons are broken down into small chain molecules. Let me spin this pen because it's annoying me. Molecules, all right. No. Two says the gaseous compound octane C8H18 undergoes cracking to produce two hydrocarbon fragments, each containing the same number of carbon atoms. Write an equation to represent the above process. Now, here we go. What do we know from this? All right. We know that octane C8H18 undergoes cracking to produce two hydrocarbon fragments. So we know that we have two um, products and each contains the same number of carbon atoms. So that means that each will contain four carbon atoms seeing that it's C8. So let's divide that by two when you get four. So we know that we're getting butane and butene as our products. So C8H18, a little fancy arrow that I like to know, stress that you remember to put. And the C4H8 would be the alkene or, you know, the butene. And the C4H2 two times four plus two, that's 10. Yes, for butane. Now B wants you to describe a simple laboratory test to distinguish between these two hydrocarbon fragments. And uh, you can use bromine water for that test. Or you could use um, the acidified KMNO4 potassium permanganate um, test. All right. And what will happen is the alkene, which is butene, will decolorize bromine water or it will decolorize acidified potassium permanganate. And what you will see is a color change for this from brick red for the bromine water, from brick red to a pale, a pale, let me not say pale, but in theory, they say colorless, but you don't really get colorless if you, you know. Told you that's my colorless, all right? And for this, you will have it fade from 
purple to colorless. I'm sure on one of my tests I put pale pink, you know, but in the books it says colorless. That's why I say it decolorizes. Anyways, now define the term structural isomerism. Now, structural isomerism, as I said, what is the occurrence where compounds or molecules have the same molecular formula. However, their structural formula, <laughs> formula is different in terms of, I'm sure I could have found some shorter way to say this, in terms of bond sequence or bond order. Now identify two types of structural isomers, giving an example of each. There are three that we were told about in our syllabus. So any three, any of these, any two of these will do. Chain, chain isomers, and that can be an example of that could be butane and um, two methylpropane, I think. Yeah. And if you're having trouble, just draw a compound and then you know find an isomer for it. If and name it. If you're having trouble, like thinking of two or one. Now functional group. That's another one, and that's where. The molecular formula is the same, but the functional groups are different. So for me, my go to my go to for functional group isomerism is an aldehyde and a ketone. So I guess you can my 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 exa my example could be propanone and um propanol null not null. Propanol is an alcohol and al and then al that's the aldehyde. So pay attention to that. And you also have position isomers, all right? And that is where the, the functional group is placed in a different um it's placed on a different atom in the compound. So the functional group is the same, of course, but it's just at a different place on the compound. So like this could be like, here's an example, but one in and but two in. This is just telling me that the double bond in, but in this butene is on the first carbon or between the first and the second carbon. Well, in but two in, the double bond is between the second and the third carbon. All right. So yeah. But as I said, if you're having trouble like thinking about it and just coming up with one just like that, always take the time to draw out your thing because at the end of the day, you want your marks. You don't care how you get your marks, you just want it, right? No. Here we have the 2014 paper two question and it says explain the terms primary, secondary, and tertiary as applied to halogen alkanes. Now, primary halogen alkanes um, has the halogen, so whether that be fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. I won't go to astatine because we don't really use that. Once you, once you have it, you know, your, your halogen, that halogen is bonded to one carbon or it's bonded to a carbon that is only bonded to one other carbon. So in this case, something looking like this. So here you have your halogen, which is bromine that I just wrote, and it's bonded to one carbon and the carbon that it is bonded to is bonded to only one other carbon. 
However, for a secondary halogen or alkane, you'll have the halogen bonded to a carbon that is bonded to two other carbons. So in this case, if you have bromine here, you have a one carbon, another carbon here, and another carbon here, right? And it's you can see that the carbon atom in which the bromine atom is bonded to is bonded to two other carbon bonded to two other carbon atoms all right now for tertiary halogen alkenes this is where the halogen is bonded to a carbon atom that is bonded to three other carbon atoms so in this case you see here i have my bromine and it is bonded to a carbon that is bonded to one two three other carbon atoms okay so that's that's that that's your explanation but of course you wouldn't draw it out like this i think they wanted worded explanation of course the xc gives you lines now b compound a is one of two straight chain bromoalkanes which can exist in two isomeric forms having a molecular formula of 137 and I want you to write the name of compound A. Now, of course, they suggested that there are two choices for you for compound A. And um, it exists, as they say, it exists in two isomeric forms. So you want to determine what those two um, possible things are. So they already told you that, um, what is this? It has a molecular mass of what? 137, and it says it's a bromoalkane, so you know that most definitely bromine is a part of your compound. So you know it's Br with some CHs in it, right? So Br, bromine, has a mass of 70 grams. I think it's 89.9990. I don't remember these things. Quiz days, the I don't remember what, yeah, you, you round up to 80, 79.9 is 80, right? Yeah, yes, yes, yeah, 79.9 rounded up is 80. Oh my God. So what I would do first is 137 minus eight, and that would give me 57, right? And now I know that we have a couple CH2s because that's how we write our condensed formulae. So we have CH3, then CH2, 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 until we end the chain with another CH3, all right? So I know that CH2 has a molecule, should I say molecular mass? Uh, for 12 plus two, which is 14. So I want to divide 14 into 57 to see how many times I would get that, right? So once I divided 14 into 57, that's what I'm doing now, I got four. So I assume that there are four CH2 molecules or CH2 units, let's say units, I like the word units in the compound. So I know that I have Br and I have CH2 about four times. And I will sum that up and see what I get, right? So again, I'll say 80 plus 12 times four because one carbon, one carbon, one carbon has a mass of 12. And then you will have H being two, and four, so four times two is eight. And then you want to add the eight, right? And that will give me 136. And that says to me that, hey, the molecular mass was 137. So you want to add another one. So what, 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 what atom has only um, a mass of one? It's hydrogen. So I know that one more hydrogen would go there. And of course, that would be, it makes sense because that would be added to my CH2 chain to give me CH3. All right. So I know that, now I know that 
my 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 oh my god my compound is um it has four carbons so it's a butane so it's either one bromobutane or it is two bromobutane all right now if you're supposed to write out your 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 structural formula for this you will find out that the two bromobutane has a chiral carbon. And I'm going to show you. Let me move this out of the way. Um, oh my God. All right, let's put that up there for now. And here we go. No, two bromobutane would we'll just tell you one, two, three, four carbons first. Two bromobutane is telling you that the bromine atom is on the second carbon. And then you just fill in with the rest, fill in the rest with H, I guess. Fill in the other H's. H is even, I think. H is, you can pronounce, you can pluralize H. Anyways, now here, see bromine. H, um, eth methyl group, sorry, and an ethyl group. So as I told you, and this would be a chiral carbon. So the nature of the isomerism exhibit exhibited by compound A is um, the presence of a chiral carbon, Um, exhibits optical isomerism. This is some risky business I'm doing here. All right, so draw the structural formula of isomer showing the relationship between them. I'm going to erase this because the thing with an optical isomer is that it has what we call the relationship I believe would be that they are mirror images of each other. So you have C, let me put BR up there. Oh my God, I probably shouldn't have erased it because now I don't remember what the thing looked like. Was it butane? <laughs> and BR, H, 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 H and H, H, H. Bear with me, guys. Um, that was what? And another H, so that would be C2H5, for the God, CH3, BR, and H, right? So let's say I put the CH3 group there, um, the, the final H, and the C2H5 group there, Right now, the other one would be, as I said, a mirror image of, of this. So put back a C, C2H5 would be here, because of course it's a mirror image, H, CH3, and BR. And I guess I would, if I were doing this test, I say if I were doing this test, but I'm doing this test. Um, I would just write a brief statement saying that um, the isomers are mirrored images of each other, I guess. And um, here we go. Number one. For the 2015 paper two, um, excuse any noises in the background, sorry. Propane is one of the major components. Let me hide this because this is also bugging me. All right, propane is one of the major components of liquefied petroleum gas, LPG, 
Now the petroleum in industry uses a process to produce another alkane and the two alkenes from propane according to the equation below. Now propane forms al an alkane or alkene B or an alkane or alkene C. And this here was that ethene is already an alkene there. And H2 gas, right? Okay, now identify the process um, represented by the equation, it's thermal cracking. There are two types of cracking, thermal cracking and catalytic cracking. Thermal cracking produces hydrogen gas as one of the products, all right? So thermal cracking. Now state the conditions at A. Um, thermal cracking um, is carried out at high temperatures. I think the number is 400 degrees Celsius, so about 800. But I think this can change anyhow, so just I would, just, I would put approximately 600 <laughs> because I am me. I'm not going to put a range. I'll always say approximately and put a figure. And um, high pressure as well. I think this was about 7,000 kilopascals, which is a lot of pascals, if you ask me. That would be like 7 million pascals. Anyways, now write the condensed structural formula of B and C. No, <laughs> we were told that we produced two alkenes and an alkane, right? Over here, your thing has to be, your, your equation has to be balanced. And we know that the formula for propane is C3H, what, eight? And we have two of them over here. So you know that overall we have six carbons and we have 16 hydrogens. Now over here, seeing that this is ethene, we have what? Two carbons already gone. So two from six will leave us with four carbons to fill the shoe here for B and C. And the four plus two, that's six hydrogen to so subtract that from 16 hydrogens and we have 10 hydrogens that we need to you know get the shoe filled now we know that it's supposed to be an alkane and an alkene now i guess you can go through and test all the possibilities but there aren't many seeing that just four carbons so um you could say that c use one C and say what would be the alkane for that because it can't be an alkene if you use one C. So, because you'd need a double bond, right? So um, smallest alkane would be methane, so CH4. If I subtract that, I'll be left with C3, four from 10 leaves six, C3H10. Did I know? I don't know what type of maths I'm doing. C C three eight six yes, and that would be propene. Yes, right. Also, possibility. What if we wanted to use two carbons? Would have C two H H what? We could have H four, and that would be ethene, and the C two H two two four and Two, six, and that's ethane, and it would still add up to four and a 10, right? And those are the only possibilities. However, B and C could not be ethene and ethane because ethene is already a product. So the only two that's left would be methane and propene, yeah. So the condensed structural formula for um, methane is CH4, and for propene, you can write it out first, right? And just see how it looks before you try to attempt to 
um, do the structural formula, but if you're a real G and can just do it from your head, that's all good. So, but it's also good to ch check that your answer is correct. You know, one, two, three, four, five, six, and that's correct. So CH3, what's that? CH, double bond CH2. And that would be it for that. Now this BI wants you to account for tetravalency of the carbon atom. No tetravalency. It's basically saying that the, the carbon atom can form four bonds, right? So that is because of hybridization. And what happens is um, one of the paired electrons from the, the 2s right orbital in, in the carbon is promoted to the p orbital where you don't where they have no pair no electrons an empty p orbital so promoted to the empty p orbital you could write out the electronic configuration for for um, carbon to find this out so it's promoted to the empty p orbital and then that would cause the mixing of orbitals and you would get sp3 hybrid orbitals that would allow for carbon to create make four bonds all right so that's how you could account for the tetravalency of an of a carbon atom and all right so 2015 paper two still Aqueous bromine will only react with propane in sunlight, but aqueous bromine reacts quickly with propane without sunlight. Using appropriate notation and equation, explain the steps um, involved in the mechanism of the chemical reaction of aqueous bromine with propane in sunlight or aqueous bromine with propane without sunlight. And look at CXC giving us options. <laughs> Bravo. So, all right, let's deal with the aqueous bromine with propane in sunlight first. Now using appropriate notation and equations. Okay, I'll just, I don't have to show any arrows and stuff. For your sake, I will. So, first of all, this, the reaction between aqueous bromine with propane, that would be, can I divide the page? Let me just do that. Free radical substitution. All right. So it, it occurs in like two stages. And then if you want to stop it, the third stage would be the, what we call the termination stage. So in the initiation stage, and you want to explain this. UV light splits what? Bromine, Br2, homolytically to create radicals. So Br, Br, and you want to use the half arrow the fish hook arrow to show that only one electron moves, right? And that would give, in the presence of UV light, of course, would give you two bromine radicals, right? Then you'll go through the propagation stage. And in the propagation stage, you will have a one of the bromine radicals reacting with um, what was that, propane, so that would be C3H8. And what you would get is a propyl radical. So C, look at me, writing foolishness. You would get C3H7 with the dot to say it's a radical and hydrogen bromide, right? Then the this one, the propyl radical, the C3H7 radical, will um, react with 
some bromine molecule in solution that hasn't been, you know, split homolytically by UV light or the sunlight and take out UV light from here and replace it with sunlight. Forgot that they specified that it was sunlight. Anyways, that will give you, is it bromopropane? Yes. So C3H7Br and another bromine radical. And that's why the reaction is continuous because the radical will be continuously regenerated and the whole process, this propagation stage will continuously happen over and over and over until you know we get to the termination step. And in the termination step, the reaction will stop once all radicals are removed from the solution. So, um, you can either have a bromine radical and a bromine radical reacting to form Br2. Could also have a bromine radical and a, pro, a propyl radical, right? H7. And that will form bromopropane that we had initially wanted. So that's what we want. So that's C3H7Br. And a, what is that now? nothing else or you could have two propyl radicals or propyl i don't know why i say propyl radicals i'm so sorry to be squinging up this thing but that will form c6h27 14 and that would be a waste product and that's free radical substitution now if you went for this part the or part and did aqueous bromine with propene what would happen is you would have, all right, BR, BR, and what's that? Propene, so C, C, double bond C, and H, and H, H, and H, and H, and H. All right, what will happen is this bromine here will be polarized, right? And when it becomes polarized, what will happen is the two electrons will go to one of the bromine atoms and it will get you know, a net positive and a net negative charge, right? Then you will have the positively charged bromine or bromine atom, or I would say ion. That positive one will attack the pi bond that's in the double bond here and cause you to get, oh my God, C, 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 B, R, H, positive and one of the, one of the, one of the carbons. So you get an intermediate color carbocation. Then the negatively charged bromine will, B, R minus will, will be added there. And then you will get, oh my God, C, 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 Br, Br, dibromopropane, right? Dibromopropane. I am tired. Yeah. And this is called, this is an electrophilic addition. Electra from that word coming from electron philly or philic or file means loving. So that means it loves negative charges. All right. Addition. I'm just here like what? No, here they want you to describe the observations expected when aqueous bromine is added to liquid heptane in sunlight. Now, of course, we already went through this. So when aqueous bromine is added to liquid heptane in sunlight, what will happen is the free radical substitution mechanism. So, you know, you the sunlight will split the bromine, form radicals, and then the whole thing will happen where you have this addition where the bromine radical will react with heptane forming, um, would it be a heptyl, heptyl 
radical, you know, that radical of heptane. And then that will react with bromine that hasn't been split yet and form bromoheptane and another bromine radical. So that that's what would happen. Now, the observation that you would expect is that bromine, the aqueous bromine, would decolorize. So, of course, you need to add a bit more to this. But that's the essence. And I guess it's two marks. So I guess you get a mark for the word decolorizes and telling the color change that you will see. So from brick red to colorless, right? Now, acidified potassium permanganate solution is added added to liquid heptene without sunlight. My God. No, the what would you what would happen is the acidified potassium permanganate will oxidize the heptene. And so what you will see is the acidified potassium permanganate will decolorize as well. And with that decolorization, you'll see a color change from purple to purple to colorless. All right. So that's that. Now here, A to D represents the structures of four organic molecules. This question is from the 2008 paper two. Was it to complete the table writing the reagent conditions and reaction mechanism for each of the following conversions? Now from A to B, A here is a regular alkene with you know, a branch and C and B, sorry, is a halogen alkene because, or a bromoalkene, whatever you want to call it, because it has bromine here. So seeing that it is, this is what we have, the reagent let's not use HBR, use BR too, right? And the condition necessary is UV light or sunlight and the reaction me mechanism is free radical Substitution. Let me just put subs. Subs. I crack myself up every day. Um, now for C to A, this is an alkene to what an alkane. And there are no halogens. So I guess the reagent would be H2. Conditions, nickel catalyst is necessary. Right. And it's an electrophilic addition for C to B, HBr is required because it's only one bromine and you know that it's double bond, so something has to add. So since it's one bromine, a hydrogen would be added across that with along with it. So it's HBr and the reaction mechanism is also an electrophilic addition. In this case, the H, the hydrogen would be the electrophile and that would attack the pi bond in the double bond here and form an intermediate carbocation that will have the bromine then attack it, right? And that's how that happens. And now here we go. Isn't this fancy looking? No, 2010 paper two. This is question one from it. it says state the reagents or the conditions necessary for each of the following reactions. I from A to D. Now this is an alkene and it forms, what's this? A ketone and a carboxylic acid. 
Now, the reagents would, the reagent here would be hot acidified potassium permanganate. You have to specify hot because hot potassium, cold, sorry, potassium permanganate, acidified potassium permanganate reacting with an alkene will give you a diol and hot acidified potassium permanganate gives you a lot of options. First, a diol will be created, then the, the potassium permanganate will oxidize the, the diol formed into either ketone, aldehyde, carboxylic acid, carbon dioxide. There is probably something else, but I don't remember. I, I um, from A to E, from A to E, that is, wow, an alcohol. So you will, the reagents are concentrated sulfuric acid. I think this is in the study guide, yeah. Water, what else? Yeah, that's it. Concentrated sulfuric acid and water. Now, this wants you to draw the structure for each of the following compounds. B, B is up here. So if that alkene had reacted with cold potassium permanganate, what would be formed at B? Remember I told you if it for a diol will be created, a diol will be created if um, a diol will be created if you react an alkene with cold potassium permanganate. So all you'd have is um, two OH or hydroxyl groups being added across that double bond. So it will look something like this and it doesn't really matter this is supposed to be CH3. I don't know what to write in. CH3, H, CH3. All right, you can write it like this, OH, going inwards, or you can write it outwards. It doesn't really matter as long as the OH attached to this point right here. So it don't matter which way you want to turn that. That's completely fine, all right? Now draw the structure for each of the following compounds. Now they're telling us to deal with C. Now liquid bromine being added across an alkene. So you know that Br, you would have two bromine atoms added across the double bond. So you'll redraw the main mainframe shape. Mainframe, mainframe. Oh my God. Um, like, count how much time is it? Oh, oh my God, for night and so it will look something like that. Doesn't matter again which way you want to turn that, as long as it's attached to like right here, you'll be fine. Now the structural formula of A2 bromo2 methyl propane is given below. Now this says, show the steps involved in the mechanism of the reaction between A and sodium hydroxide using curved arrows and a fish hook notation to show the movement of electrons. All right, so first of all, you want to know what type of reaction this will be, whether it will be electrophilic addition, neutrophilic substitution. So I guess you decide, right? So save on space, should I write everything? Yes, let me do that. No, CH3, CH3, Br, H3C. No, you'll have, you will have both electrons going over to the more electronegative bromine. So in Jamaican terms, it will pop off and you're going to get an intermediate with this, you're going to get a carbocation. So let me just write back CH3, CH3, 
CH3C. Of course, you could just write CH3, I'm just extra. And um, plus for carbocation and a bromine ion or a bromide ion, sorry. And then what will happen is, remember any OH, now OH would take the minus charge, right? So OH minus will attack this, right? And that would give you the C, CH3, CH3, H3C, and OH. And of course, you want to make this as clean as possible. And the, and the reaction mechanism here would be nucleophilic substitute. And what's the nucleophile being, being substituted? Brom, the bromide ion. Now the bromide ion is the nucleophile because it loves positive charges. So it's negatively charged. So of course it will want to go to the positive charge, but it's being substituted with OH. So that's why it's nucleo nucleophilic substitution. For some reason, I think I said electrophilic addition a while ago and that's so wrong. So yeah, that's why it's nucleophilic substitution. All right. Sleep a call mini. All right, compound A is an alkene. Study its structural formula given below and answer the questions which follow. All right, so um, give the structural formula for the reaction of compound A with aqueous bromine. Now, if it reacts with aqueous bromine, it will have one bromine atom and an OH. So added across the double bond. So your new structural formula would be this. I like to write this first, would add across that. CH3, I just add in the rest. Deal with it like a step at a time. All right, guys, I'm so sorry, but my Wi-Fi just went out. I'm wondering what kind of sauce area is this. But I hope you guys hearing me now. All right, let's continue. So give the structural formula for the compound A, right? So you need to know that you need to pick up the difference between liquid bromine and aqueous bromine. Now with all right, great. Now with liquid bromine, you'd have two bromine atoms added across the double bond. So you'd end up with this, right? And I guess, let me just not write it weird. H, I don't think it matters anyways. CH3 and whoa, 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 H3. And that would be your answer for that. Now, this says compound A is an alkene is the same question. Now it says give the structural formula of the compound of co for the reaction of compound A with what's that? Cold potassium permanganate or acid acidified potassium permanganate. Now remember, I told you when that happens, it's going to form a diol. So you want to know that 
two OHs, the two OHs will add across the double bond. So C, and you'd have OH, OH, H, H, CH3, and H3C, right? Right now, I am praying you are hearing me because the Wi-Fi hasn't come back on my phone yet. So that's a problem. This is the same question. Oh, no. So this one says, how about when it is added to hot potassium permanganate, right? No, remember you form either ketone, diol, not diol, um, ketone, carboxylic acid, aldehyde or whatever, but also carbon dioxide. So can have this as your answer or what would be formed CH3. CH3, you're probably wondering where the other C, because there are four Cs in this, um, it would be in carbon dioxide, all right? So that's where that would have gone. Okay, great. Thank you, Zachary. So state whether compound A exhibits um, cis trans isomerism. Um, no, it does not. And oh, they asked you to give two reasons why that's great. No, no, the reason why um, for your answer, giving reasons for your answer why you can't say that this um, exhibits cis trans um, isomerism is that first of all, both H's here are on the same side of the double bond. So for it to be cis trans, it would have to be, um, what you call it now? It would either have to be here and here for the hydrogen or here and here, right? So this would represent cis and this would represent trans, all right? And a second reason could be the fact that the, the thing is these, the groups are the same, you need different groups. So you can't have CH3, CH3, and even if, all right, let's say, if you had CH3, CH3, this wouldn't be cis trans, you would need a different group. All right, so now this says, outline the mechanism for the reaction between compound A and the hydrogen bromide using curved arrows to show the movement of electrons. Say the type of mechanism outlined. No compound A with HBr, like it would be the same mechanism that I've been showing you up here, but I'll still tell you what happens for the sake of telling you. But I don't think I'm going to draw another mechanism. All right, so HBr, what will happen is HBr is already polarized because bromine has um, is more electronegative than hydrogen. So of course the electrons will be pulled more closely to bromine. So it will have a delta positive, delta negative charge, sorry. And hydrogen would have a de delta positive charge. No, the hydrogen here would attack the pi bond that's here and add across the, the add to one of these carbons. And what will happen is a carbocation will be formed. So that's your intermediate. And then of course your carbocation has a positive charge. And so the bromine that had a delta negative charge will actually go and bond with that carbocation across the double bond. And you'd end up with, um, that's pro, what? you'll end up with this H B R. H, H, CH3, CH3 and CH3, yeah. Nice. And if you do all of this and say the type of reaction and this reaction would be electrophilic addition, if you say all of that, you get six marks and you're good to go. Now methane here reacts with bromine in the presence of UV light to produce 
a number of substitution products, one of which is bromomethane. Now state the role of UV radiation in the reaction and UV radiation, the, the role. The role of UV radiation is to split the halogen molecule. In this case, that is bromine, because they tell us that the product is bromomethane, or they did tell you that it's bromine, um, homolytically. Right? So that's that. It says write the equation to show the steps occurring in the propagation stage for the formation of dibromomethane from bromomethane. Now, what's the formula for bromomethane? Now, CH3Br would be the formula for bromomethane because methane is CH4, so drop a hydrogen and give you Br, right? So what you find in the propagation stage, right, the equations, and remember that happens in two steps. So CH3Br will react with one of the bromine radicals and give you CH3, CH2, sorry, a CH2 Br radical and HBr, right? The H, you can see that it came from here to give you the, the HBr, right? So that's where, and then that would be the other bromine radical, but that's besides the point. No, you will have that radical C2Br radical reacting with some bromine in solution that hadn't been split homolytically by um, the UV radiation yet. And that would form CH2Br2. So that's where you get the dibromomethane that we needed or what the, that they said would have been produced and another bromine radical. Those two equations give you your two marks. Now this question. We have gone through the module one, so we're at module two. This is 2011, paper two. So I want you to distinguish between the terms precision and accuracy. Now precision refers to how close a set of values are to each other. to each other while accuracy refers to how close a value is to the true value or, or the actual value, right? Whatever that may be. <laughs> Now, a student was asked to measure 50 centimeter cube of a liquid in order to carry out an experiment. List three pieces of apparatus that could be used to accurately measure the required volume. Now, a pipette could be used. I hope that's how pipette is spelled. I doubt it, it's one P. And I can't manage. Pipette, and it still look funny. Anyways, I don't think that matters right now. I'll learn to spell it before my exam tomorrow. Burette, volumetric flask. Um, what else we have in the lab that can do things like this? I wouldn't say measuring cylinder for a lot of reasons. No, a measuring cylinder doesn't have to be accurate. Like the pipette gives you the line, the burette gives you the line, and a volumetric gives you flask gives you the line if you look at it. The volumetric flask is this big, big round thing with the with the line there. So at like 250 ml. And you have smaller ones too, but they're like round bottom flasks and they look like that. And they have like a goal line. I don't think all of them have a goal line, but the ones in the lab at my school has a goal line 
what, yeah, those are volumetric flasks, the round bottom flasks. I am terrible. Let me continue. Anyways, so each of the four students carried out an experiment to determine the percentage acetic acid in a vinegar sample. The, proce the procedure was repeated four times by each student and the result recorded in table two, and the results recorded in table two. Complete table two by calculating the standard deviation of each of the four sets of results using the formula SD, you know, is equal to the square root of the sum of the, the values minus the, I think that X bar would be the mean values of, yes, that's mean, squared over N minus one, which is the mean, you'll actually divide or find the mean of the values that you you used. So um, I'll just show you what I mean. I don't do maths. I need to stop telling people that though. So um, basically what you would have is 24, 0.15 minus 24.13 and put that squared plus this, the same thing, 24.20 minus 24.13 squared, then 24.10 minus 24.13 squared, and then 20 plus 24.05 minus 24.13 squared. And then there are one, two, three, four values or four different volumes. So you put that four over four minus one and find the square root of that. So let me put that into my calculator and see what I get. And hopefully I get this the right answer. So as I said, 24.15 minus 24.13 and square that. And it doesn't matter if you get a negative number and you do the minus by squaring it, you'll get rid of the minus sign. 24.20, right? Minus 24.13 square that plus 24.10 um, minus 24.13, and you square that, add that to 24.05 minus 24.13, and square that, right? And I told you to put that over one, two, three, four different volumes minus one, and find the square root of that answer. And you should get um, 0 0.065. I'll just leave it there at three decimal places since they didn't specify, right? No, you want to do the same thing for student two, student three, and student four. It's going to take a while, but yeah, it's but I, I don't know. It just take a time because you don't want to mess up and have to do this again. I know I don't want to mess up under this again. I don't have the patience for it. 3.0, minus 25, right? Squared plus 24.00 minus 25.00 squared plus 24.00 minus 26.00 squared plus 20. Six is it 26.00 minus 25.00? Could I just say 25 squared divided by four minus one? And then you want to find I got seven over three, then you want to find the square root of that. And I got 1.53 for that standard deviation. Oh my god, did I say I was going to three decimal places or three six? All right, three decimal places. Wait, should I? Yeah, I don't know. I always get confused between whether we should go to like the three decimal places or three or three significant figures. No, all right, let me look at this. No, one, two, three, four, five. What am I counting? That's four numbers, oh my God. So four, yeah, I'm going to leave it like that at three significant figures. All right, so do the same thing for student three. 
And for those who don't understand what I'm doing, I'm going to try and write out the full equation now for what I will be doing for um, student three, all right? So basically what I did for standard deviation, 29.15 minus 28.78, put that in bracket squared plus, 24.95, oh my God, minus 28.78 squared plus 33.25 minus 27.75 squared plus 28. Wait. No, it's not 28, it's 27.75. 27.75 minus 28.78. Square that, All right? One, two, three, four different values. All of that now over four minus one. And then when you put, when you find the answer for that, just put square root it. Or you could be a real G and put all of that in the calculator, but I don't trust myself like that. So I do it in parts. So let me just put that in the calculator and tell you what I get. 29.15, probably should have done all of this before. 0.78 um, squared, right? Plus 24.95 minus 28.78 squared plus 33.25. Minus 28.78. You're seeing this? I wrote 27.75 up here. That's where I got the whole mix up. 27, 28, sorry, 0.78. Bear with me, guys. I'm tired. All right, 28.78, and then square that plus. 27, no, 0.75 minus 28.78 squared all over four minus one. And you find the square root of that. I got 3.46. You see the standard deviation that big, like your, your error in the error in your experiment is large. All right, if your standard deviation, okay, great, you saw the error, thank you. Is it a killer? Thank you though. All right, so three, if your error in your standard deviation is that large, like bro, you need to go do over your experiment. Trust me. Now let's do student four real quick because time is going and I think some of us have bedtimes. <laughs> me. 25.10 minus 28 point, oh my God, 25, I need to concentrate. Minus 25 squared plus 24.90 minus what? 25 again squared plus 25. Isn't that Z going to be zero? Minus 25 squared. And again, 25. 25 minus 25 squared. And I divide that by four minus one. I need to put that over in my calculator. I press something and I don't know what I did wrong. 25.10 minus 25 squared plus 24.90 minus 25 squared plus 25 minus 25 squared plus 25 minus 25 squared, right? Over four minus one. Yes, I got the answer now. So I'm square root that. And I got 0 0.082, all right? <laughs>
Now, that's my standard deviation. Those are the standard deviations. Now, they want you to evaluate the results obtained by each student by commenting on the accuracy and precision, precision of each set of title values. Now, looking at the title volumes one, two, three, and four, for student one, I can say that um, by rough estimation, um, the, they needed to, um, what, they needed to get 50 centimeter cubes, so they would need to get as close enough to the, um, what you call it, 25 or half the value, seeing that they're only um, pipetting for whatever instrument they're using, they're only taking 25, 25 centimeter cube volumes at a time. So for student one, I would say that they're, the, the results were precise because they're close to each other. Like she, the person is constantly getting 24, 24, 24, 24, but point something different, right? But point something different. But it's not accurate because they didn't get 25. So that would be, if it, just imagine getting 24.13, right? Point, let me put that in, 24.13 twice. That would mean that the person would have gotten a total of 48.26, and that's not 50. So it's not accurate. And um, here we have 26, 24, 24, 26. Um, I wouldn't, this is not precise. And that's also a reason why the standard deviation is so large, because the, 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 the values aren't precise, but it's accurate. No, 29, 24, 33, 37, ask Christ. This is not accurate and it is not precise. Um, 25, 24, 25, 25, 25, 25. I would say it's precise and accurate. But you can challenge me because I don't think I even I don't have no I don't have any I don't think I have any um, <laughs> I don't think I have any set rule or anything that I was ever given to actually do state whether something is precise or accurate. I just go off gut feeling to be very honest. Let's look at the values and say hey. How you say so, how you said so. You said so nice. Oh my God, I need to stop embarrassing myself. All right, so a student was asked to calibrate 10 centimeter, a 10 centimeter cube pipette, um, outline the um, experimental steps that should be taken by, student, by the student to complete this ex exercise. I did this lab at school and it was hell. You know how much time I had to do it over? She's so strange. Oh my God. So what we did was um, we got the pipette that we needed and uh, um, we took up, you know, I think we'd use a 25 centimeter cube pipette, but let, let me just, 25 centimeter cube pipette, but let me just say 20, 10 in this case, I'm going to tell you as if we use that 10 centimeter cube pipette. So using the 10 centimeter cube pipette, you want to, you know, pipette out, 10 centimeter cube of water. Again, oh, I was right, it's one P. So pipette to 10 centimeter cube of water, get a small, get a beaker and release the water into the the beaker, you want to take the temperature of the water at intervals. So remember that. So take the temperature of the water at intervals or intervals. Oh my God, I chat so bad. And once you take the temperature, you want to also, before you had put the, before putting the, the water into the beaker, take the mass of the be the empty beaker, right? Take the mass of the empty beaker and record it. And once you do that and add the water, you want to take the mass of the beaker and water 
and record that. Now you want to repeat the experiment a couple of times, right? By adding, um, by adding, what do you call that now? 10 centimeter cube of water using a pipette. You want to take your, yeah, you want to, sorry, I was, I'm actually reading the chat and um, that's why I, I keep pausing. <laughs> Because my brain can work, read and talk at the same time, I guess. All right. So once you want to keep repeating the experiment, adding 10 centimeter cube of water, using a pipette at a time, you know, keep on doing that and adding and adding. You don't know, just do it for a couple of times, like five, six, seven, eight. I think we did it 10 times. And each time you have to take the, the, the new mass of the beaker and the water and record it. And then what you want to do now to calculate, do your calculations, you want to subtract subtract the mass of the beaker from the mass of the beaker plus the water to get the mass of the water. And of course, you were supposed to be taking the temperature at intervals, so intervals, so I hope you remember that. And you want to use the density of water at whatever temperature you had and calculate, calculate, yes, the volume of water. As you know, the formula for density is mass over volume. Right, so once you use that to create, um, to calculate your volume of water, you will know like, uh, you can use that now to calculate the standard deviation or the error in your measurement or the error in the pipette. And pipettes are most, most, most times accurate unless, you know, um, some what grade seven going there and break the tip. Yeah, or some other thing is wrong with the instrument. So they're most, for the most part, for the most part, always, or always, for the most part, all the time, they're accurate. So that would be great for you. So that's how you would calibrate your pipette. Now the titration question, isn't this lovely? Titration is a method used in volumetric analysis to determine the concentration of a solution. Now define each of the following terms. I hope C set gives us um CXC gives us a couple definitions because that didn't happen for physics. I'm still looking for it. But huh, isn't life lovely? So the equivalent point is the point at which the analyte completely neutralizes the standard, right? So that's the equivalent point. So analyte neutralizes the standard. And I can't tell something like for talk, let me chat enough. End point though, the end point is the point in the reaction where the indicator shows that the analyte completely neutralized the standard. I promise you I write better than this. <laughs> oh my God. I'm so excited to show you guys the PowerPoint. So yeah, so if it's like, um, what should I say? Yeah, if it's like uh, um, a phenolphthalein indicator, I know that it's colorless in acid, pink in basic solutions. Once you start to see that change of pink, that would be the end point. And in um, like thermometric or conduct, metric or, or potential metric titration, once you can indicate that the equivalence point is met through um, the indicator, that's the end point, right? All right, here we go with this crap. The concentration of a solution of barium chloride can be determined using sodium carbonate solution by the technique of back titration. Now use the example of barium chloride. Is it barium or barium? I don't care. 
given above to explain the technique of back titration. Now, back titration is a bit extra. I know, like, I don't know why they have to be so extra, but then I get the point after a while of thinking about it. But like, oh my God. Anyways, so barium chloride um, is insoluble in water. Hence why they would use um, back titration to find out its concentration. So the first thing that will happen is you would react barium chloride or barium chloride with an excess acid or excess of an acid. So whether that be HCl or whatever. So BACL2, I'm lazy, and plus acid in excess. So that's what would happen first in your back titration. Then what you want to do is react that solution with a strong base. And most often, NaOH is used. And that, will, that base will react with the excess acid, right? Then by knowing the excess acid that reacted or the amount of NaOH you used to neutralize the excess acid, you can calculate how much acid was used, right? So when you calculate how much acid was used it, or was neutralized by the NaOH, you can find the number of moles of acid neutralized by NaOH, right? And once you know the number of moles of acid neutralized by NaOH, you already knew how much acid you had reacted at first so let's say in, in theory, 20 centimeter cube was your excess amount of acid. You can find out how many moles of the acid is in 20 centimeter cube, right? Based on the concentration of that acid, right? Because you're supposed to know that. You're supposed to know the concentration of the acid and, and the base as well. So once you know that, you can subtract the number of moles of the acid that was neutralized by NaOH from the original amount. So that would leave you to find out how much was actually reacted with the BACL. And you find out that now you can find out the number of moles of BACL that took part in the reaction. It's like the normal mole ratio thing find out how much BACL that took part in the reaction. And when you find out how, how many moles of BACL2 that took part in the reaction, you can divide that by the, um, the volume of BACL used in the reaction, and that would give you your concentration of BACL2. Yeah, that was a mouthful took me a while to actually understand this back titration thing. And here is the question. All right, so 25 centimeter cube of a solution containing barium chloride is placed in a beaker and the barium ions quantitatively completely or completely precipitated by boiling with an excess of sodium carbonate solution containing 0 0.005 moles. After filtration, the remaining sodium carbonate solution needed 0 0.004 moles of hydrogen or hydrochloric acid to, for neutralization. Now this wants you to write the equation for the precipitation of barium ions. So barium Ba2 plus, aqueous plus um, carbonate, CO3, two minus, right? Aqueous will give you solid barium carbonate and it's BACO3 solid. And because the two state symbols are two plus and two minus, all right? Now, Calculate the number of moles of um, NaCO3 remaining after filtration. Now, let's think about this. After filtration, the remaining um, sodium carbonate solution needed 0 0.04 um, moles of hydro hydrochloric acid to neutralize it. 
guess you'd write a whole equation. So any 2CO3 plus HCl, and you know, this is a, an acid and a carbonate, and you know, that gives you a salt, water, and carbon dioxide. So that would give you the salt, any Cl, or yes, any Cl plus CO2 and H2O, right? Now balance the equation. We have two here, two here, right? And I think that's all right. It's balanced. Yes, because two, two oxygen and one here give it three. So yes, it's balanced. So, <laughs> my God, like they don't give you any room for mistakes. One mistake and the whole question mash up. Like why six year try and mash, mash up my life? Like, bro, calm down. So now we can say that um, sodium carbonate reacts in a one to two mole ratio with HCl, so if zero, all right, let's write that. One mole of Na2CO3 needs two HCl, then 0 0.04 moles that they said of HCl was needed to neutralize some amount of that. So it wants to tell you after to neutralize the, um, the amount of sodium carbonate that remained after filtration. So no. You want to do the whole cross multiplication thing. That's what I was taught. But this would eventually amount to 0 0.04 over 2 would be like half of that, which would be 0 0.002 moles of Na2CO3, right? So that would be the number of moles of sodium carbonate that were made after filtration. I know they want you to deduce the number of moles of what's that barium chloride, which reacted with the sodium carbonate solution. All right, so initially we had a Z excess of 0 0.005, um, 0 0.005, um, moles of sodium carbonate and we know that the excess the, car, the sodium carbonate that remained after filtration to actually react with um the hydrochloric acid was 0 0.02 so you want to 0 0.005 minus 0 0.002 and that will tell you that 0 0.003 moles of sodium carbonate reacted with barium chloride, right? And number of moles that, no, we need to know the mole ratio for barium chloride and sodium carbonate. So let's work that out, BaCl2. We don't think it's going to be a one-to-one, -one, but I'm not sure, so let's look at it and sodium carbonate Na2CO3. I think this is going to be a displacement displacement, displacement reaction. So you're going to end up with BaCO3 and NaCl and two, two, to balance that and I think everything else is fine. Yes. So we know that oh see barium chloride and sodium carbonate reacts in a one-to-one -one mole ratio. So that means that 0 0.03 moles of barium chloride one-to-one -one mole ratio. That means that 0 0.003 moles, 0 0.003 moles of BaCl2 reacted. And if that is the case, calculate the concentration of barium ions in moles per decimeter cube. Now, we know that it was 25 centimeter cube of some, but we need to put that in decimeter cube. So let's do that. 
I'm going to show you how I usually do it, but by now, like after doing it over time, I just know that I'm supposed to divide by a thousand. So 25 centimeter cube times one, let's put decimeter cube because that's what I'll need to find over centimeter cube. So that would cancel that out anyways. 10 centimeters equal one decimeter and I'll cube both. So yeah you would end up with 25 times 10 to the minus three, which is the same as 25 over 1,000. And that would be what your decimeter cube would look like for the solution. And we know that it's 0 0.003 moles of um, barium chloride, which is, you know, one to two with the chloride ions over, 25 times 10 to the minus three decimeter cube. Right? Yeah, dissociation. Would you end up with two BAs? No, it's one BA, so it's correct. So no multiplication going on there. So divide 0 0.003 by 25 times 10 to the minus three, which is 0 0.025. And you should get 0 0.12 moles per decimeter cube, which you can also write as 0 0.12 big M, big M molar. That's also molarity, I think. I'm not moving on till I write this M properly. All right, fair enough. All right, I'm going to skip this, go down to ethanol the ethanol questions then i'm going to show you guys my powerpoint and let you all go on your way and go to sleep so you don't have to be here talking to me i'm saying talking to me like you guys talking to me i'm here talking to you anyways let's do the ethanol questions then we'll then as i told you i did not do anything on I didn't do anything on ammonia yet. I haven't studied that yet. So I'm going to just do the run through with you guys here and then go through, see how many of the questions I can actually do on my own. So no promises for the ammonia questions, guys. So fermentation has been, been used over the ages to incorporate, to incorporate some alcoholic content in homemade beverages. Many starting materials can be used, including potatoes, grapes, and corn, right? Now, what chemical feature do all the mentioned um, starting materials possess? And that's carbs, carbohydrates, all right? And now give two differences in homemade alcoholic beverages resulting from the use of different starting materials. Sometimes the color will be different, the smell will be different as well, the, I think. Yeah, and the flavor will be different because grapes are used to make wine. I think barley and stuff like that are used to make rum and rum has a way different taste from wine and a whole new consistency. And I think the smell is different as well. Now, briefly describe a simple laboratory method to um, determine the relative percentage alcohol in two homemade beverages. Um, so first you want to take um, equal volumes, equal volumes of both beverages, right? And then you want to put it through a distillation process. So distill both volumes. Of beverages. Of course, um, when you're answering, fix up your answers. All right, don't write them like, oh, I'm writing them now because that's not cute. No, then you want to, you want to compare the, volumes of the distillates after 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 the distillation process to 
Should I just went live yet tomorrow no? at school? <laughs> Why Jesus? All right, Distil- after the distillation process. And that would um, help you to determine the relative percentage um, of the alcohol in both. So, yeah. And I think the percentage would be found by um, percentage. No, that don't make no sense. Yes, it would be found by the the distillate after after the distillation process over the original um, volume of the beverage times one hundred. So that's how you'd find the the uh, the relative alcohol content. Now, ethanol is described as um, the most common drug legally used by adults and illegally used by young people. I like how they specify illegally used by young people. Uh, explain why ethanol is classified as a drug. All right, ethanol, alcohol for those who don't know. And um, why is it classified as a drug? Because it makes alterations. So the nervous system, or you could just say that it affects the central nervous system, right? So that's why it's called a drug, because anything that affects the central nervous system or the nervous system on a whole is a drug. And the drugs can be um, depressors. I forgot what the opposite of depressor is. The thing that depressors like um, suffocate, like I don't want to say suffocate, but it suppresses emotions and stuff like that. And while the other thing would get you up in your, like a more jiggly state. <laughs> Why did I say jiggly? But I think I get what I'm saying. Now describe, briefly describe four consequences of alcohol abuse on social and economic structures of um, or society. I learned this in bio the other day. So, um, Hangovers can reduce, cause the reduction of productivity in the workplace um, because why? Why can hangovers cause for, um, reduce the reduction of productivity in the workplace? Because people not going to work. Um, also, there is the the problem of uh, the loss of lives due um, due to DUIs, and the DUI means driving under the influence. Number three, another social issue is um, people. I guess people who abuse alcohol are they're kind of irritable, right? And irritable meaning that um, they're easily angered. So they have behavior, behavioral issues. And four, oh, they asked for four, isn't that lovely? Anybody want to help me out? Uh, in influences, antisocial behavior, loss of lives, hangover, redu- reduced productivity. Um, Jesus Christ. Oh, is it? medical issues. I can't believe I forgot that. I want to be a doctor and forgot that. Can cause medical issues such as cirrhosis, liver damage, um, respiratory issues, cardiac issues, medical problems, right? And that can even be a strain on the economy because um, money used to provide people who abuse drugs with um, is actually a part of the Ministry of Health. Like I think it's a part of the budget where they have um, aid for those people. So with them being, st- um, with them abusing drugs and stuff, it, it, that will cause money to be funneled there instead of somewhere else where it is needed. And um the drug abuse thing doesn't really have to happen, even though some people have their problems, you understand that, but (laughs) I don't want to be politically incorrect about this, um, choosing my words wisely, but yeah. 
let me not. Let's just continue. Now, figure one shows the materials used to illustrate the process of fermentation. Now, state the names of the substances A and B in the suspension. Now, fermentation takes place with yeast and other starchy products or carbohydrates. So, um, I guess anyone, I guess so. Yeast, starch, slash carbs, right? And then you want to say, state what would be observed after a period of time in the conical flask and the beaker. Um, in the conical flask, you will see bubbles. That's due to carbon dioxide. Um, there's a fancy word for bubbles, effervescence. No. If I spell this right, I deserve something, but check that spelling. Uh, I can bet money that it's incorrect. Okay, um, I'm seeing breakdown of family structures. That could be one. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah. Breakdown of family structures. See with me, guys. I'm having a delay, so I'm not seeing, like, I think you guys, I'm way ahead of you guys, so... <laughs> That's why. And in the beaker, um, white precipitate. And the white precipitate would be because of, hold on, let me write precipitate. Yeah, that spoke correctly. This calcium hydroxide, we also call that lime, or lime water, lime water. And in the presence of CO2, lime water turns white, All right? So that's the that's the reason. Okay, and this is the last ethanol question. Then we're going into my my the thing that I've been waiting for for the longest time. You go, you guys going to see why I'm excited to show you the whole point. Now the fermentation process is carried out in um surrounding in the in surroundings where the temperature is controlled. Very high temperatures must be avoided and give a reason for this condition. Um, you don't want to, you don't want to kill. Yeast is what, 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 not here, but phylum. What domain does um, yeast fall under? Because high temperatures can kill yeast, just like high temperatures can kill bacteria and fungi, right? So you don't want very high temperatures because you don't want to ruin what you are actually fermenting. Because if you ruin the yeast before you, the fermentation process takes place, then you won't get any ethanol. So basically the fermentate, to avoid destroying the yeast, that's so, so weird, but that's it. No. Yeah, guys, we're going to go through the PowerPoint now with the ammonia thing and the Haber process and all of that and do a quick revision and then go through those questions and then um, I'm most definitely going to sleep. And um, I'm sorry, I, don't, I didn't find any gravimetric, gravimetric analysis questions. Um, I think, I think this has sound. Yes, it does. So I'm going to have to disable that. Give me a second. Hold it. How do I mute? Um, mute. Is it muted? Yes, it is. Great. All right, so let's go through ammonia. I had a lot of fun making this. Do I have to do this like how I did the presentation though? Um, hello crewmates, proceed to the reactor. If you know me, if you, are, if you are my friend, you know that I love Among Us. I will play it all day, every day. But I don't know, some people beg to differ, but that's one of my favorite games. And this, this summer, I have a lot of content lined up. I'll be doing gameplay and all kinds of stuff. I'll actually be revealing my face. So if you're not following me on Instagram, go to underscore C-A-M underscore E-O. 
or and I'll follow you back or go to young underscore. I shouldn't say or go and go to young underscore genius dot official and follow me on Instagram so that when I post like the QA thing, you can actually ask me a question. So my video won't be a whole flop show. <laughs> All right. So there, there are three modes: how uses and impact. No, we're going to how first. Now, the first task is to produce your starting materials and the starting materials for the, um, the production of ammonia through the Haber process um, are nitrogen, hydrogen, and we need an iron catalyst. Now, first we're going to form syngas and that to do this, you have to react steam with methane at 700 degrees Celsius to 1,100 degrees Celsius and at approximately 20 atmospheres. So um, from this, we need methane and water in its gaseous state. So in order to get carbon dioxide and H, the H2 gas that we, um, we need for the production of ammonia. And you can see that from the methane, and the reaction between water, we got carbon dioxide and three H2 molecules. All right, I should probably get my fancy little pointer. And here is, here is my laptop annoying me again. Laser point. Oh my God. All right, great, I got my pointer. So you have a CH4, that's methane reacting with water or gaseous water, <laughs> gaseous H2O, to give you carbon dioxide and H2 gas. And that's how you form syngas, right? And that's what we really need to do to get the H2. That's how we get H2 for the, um, the, for the, as one of the starting materials, hydrogen, one of the starting materials to form ammonia, right? Now, you need to get more hydrogen. And so you lower the temperature to about 130, 130 degrees Celsius and then add a nickel oxide catalyst. And you can obtain that from storage there, dear crewmate. I, I don't know if you can tell that I had a lot of fun doing this. <laughs> Anyways, so um, the the when you're dealing with the, let me not talk about the compromised temperature right now, but yeah. You need to obtain more hydrogen. So you're going to lower the temperature to 130 degrees Celsius and add a nickel catalyst. Then the other starting material that we'll need is nitrogen. And we get nitrogen from the air. So first it goes through a filtration process. So here, you know, that's the O2 room. So you filter the air to get rid of the dust and then when you are done, you lower the temperature of the air to about minus 200 degrees Celsius to make the air liquid. Once you do that, we'll separate gases such as oxygen, argon, and the nitrogen that we need by fractional distillation. All right. So, of course, go to O2, filter your air, get rid of the dust, those leafy things that we don't need, then lower the temperature of the air to minus 200 degrees Celsius. And then, you know, when you get by then, air is, approx is, about, is um, actually liquid at minus 200 degrees Celsius. And then we'll get the nitrogen by um, fractional distillation. All right, I hope that was clear. Then you want to purify the gases that you got. So we got hydrogen as our starting product and we got the nitrogen. And the hydrogen and nitrogen gases are purified to remove sulfur dioxide and hydrogen sulfide and all of that, because we wouldn't want them poisoning the catalyst now. <laughs> so well done, crewmate. Now that we have our starting materials, let's start the Haber process. Your next task is to make ammonia. So let's get into it. I hope you guys aren't sleeping on me. I'm having too much fun for you to be doing that. All right, so mix the hydrogen and nitrogen gas. In order to complete the Haber process, there are a few things um, that usually happen. 
like well due to the fact that n2 gas and h2 gas um reacts and you can see that that's an equilibrium um um that's an equilibrium equation is an equilibrium equation it follows le chatelier's principle no fancy term what is le chatelier's principle now le chatelier's principle also known as a chatelier's principle or the equilibrium law states that whenever a system experiences a disturbance such as a change in concentration a change in temperature or pressure changes, it will respond to restore the equilibrium state because everybody likes to be comfortable, right? So if, um, let's say I'm here sitting all fine and dandy in my chair and uh, Sasha come push me, like I want to stay in my, my chair, Sasha. So I'm going to place my butt back on my chair, Sasha, because I like my comfort zone. All right, so that's basically what an, um, <laughs> that's what the reaction will do. So if you disturb it, it's going to try to go back to how it originally was. And that's the principle of Le Ch that's the basis of Le Chatelier's principle. For real, the temperature is increased to about 200 atmosphere and temperature lowered to um, 400 degrees Celsius called a compromise. Now, earlier I had actually mentioned this term, the compromise, but it probably flew away heads because I didn't say it like, I'm trying to tell you, I just mentioned it. Oh, wow, interesting. Sam, you aren't interested. <laughs> Yuppie, if you know me, I talk like that. Yuppie, those are just the simple conditions for the Haber process, all right? So why the ways in which ammonia is produced in the laboratory? We can do it through thermal decomposition of ammonium, ammonium chloride and the reaction of ammonium and hydroxide ions. But the Haber process is used on a much larger scale. And that's why we're going to deal with the Haber process, right? So the starting products, hydrogen and nitrogen, are compressed, then sent to the reactor. Now this among us, among us, Jesus Christ, this among us thing is so um, fitting for, <laughs> for this because of course I actually sent it to the reactor. Yeah. So nitrogen and hydrogen is sent to the reactor, right? It's compressed and sent to the reactor. And in the reactor, Ammonia is cooled down and the and the liquid the liquefied ammonia is tapped off, meaning it is like, you know how you turn on one pipe on water and out it. Yeah, that I mean that's what I mean by top tapped off. So the unused gases now are recycled back to the reactor. But what exactly happened, right? Like we are talking about girl, <laughs> what you're talking about. So the forward, uh, the forward reaction for the process of um, the Haber process, or you know, the formation of ammonia using hydrogen and what N nitrogen? Yeah, it's exothermic. I think it's minus ninety two degrees, no kilojoules per mole. I don't know where I get degrees from, but it's exothermic. So it's minus 92 kilojoules per mole, and this is done to lower the cost of production. Um, this process that I'm going to explain to you is done to lower the cost of production by maximizing the production of ammonia. So again, when I think it was Pink who said that the temperature is lowered to a compromise of about 400, um, the temperature is lowered to 400 degrees Celsius, which we call a compromise, right? And it is increased to about, what was that, 200 atmospheres? Yeah, 200 atmospheres. Now the high pressure and low pressure is done to, 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 to maximize the yield of ammonia. Now through Le Chatelier's principle, like increasing the pressure would favor the sides with the lesser amount of moles and thus um, the equilibrium will shift to the right. That's all right with my left hand, so this is right. So more ammonia would be produced, so it would be going that way, right? 
over here because over here we have a total of two moles while over here it's a total of four moles. So by increasing the pressure, we'll shift to the side with a, what? Fewer or lesser amount of moles or number of moles. And then the lower temperature will favor the exothermic reaction or the forward reaction because remember, Le Chatelier's principle states that if you disturb it, the, the system will do the opposite in order to restore equilibrium. And based on what I'd said, the forward reaction is exothermic. So by lowering the temperature, the system will try to combat that by raising the temperature. And so the forward reaction is favored and the equilibrium will shift to the right. So I hope that's clear. All right, so, hey. Well, hey, Kumit, it's time to learn about the uses of ammonia. So let's proceed to security and see what everyone is up to. All right, so I made my classmates guess this. So here we have green on a farm, this gray person on the battlefield in a war zone, now this this um, woman in front of a tie-dye blanket, or I don't even know what that is. <laughs> and then you have Mr. Clean. Yes, this woman in her little, she look like a housewife, don't. <laughs> the, the um, I don't even think you have that color in Among Us though. <laughs> um, the, the magenta looking one, purple, pink. I don't even know anymore. Anyways, she's standing with Mr. Clean, so. I'll explain now what everybody is doing. So the man or the gray one, or it was supposed to be black, but I didn't want to use solid black because that wouldn't show up. So ammonia saved us in World War I. If it weren't for our comrades Bosch and Haber, Germany would have, wouldn't have food or explosive, explosives. The war wouldn't have lasted until 1918. No, ammonia was used in the war to make explosives, um, specifically World War I, and also um, nitrogen-based products were, were um, used to help with the production of food and such. And then Farmer George could like back that up and say, holy partner, <laughs> I used to sear ammonia to fertilize me crops. And I know it's in my livestock feed. All right, so ammonia is used as a fertilizer or used in fertilizers. And it's also used in livestock feed. Well, here we go with housewife Betty. Well, hey. To ensure I have a strong household, I need the dyes to make beautiful clothes for children and the detergents to keep a clean house. Ammonia, a big help. So like like one, one advertisement or one commercial. I'm laughing way too much. I'm probably even talking too fast. Like, let me know if I'm talking too fast. No, ammonia is also used um, to make dyes and also used in detergents to clean houses, right? <laughs> All right, so, well, hello there, crewmate. It's my turn to inform you of the impact of ammonia, the ammonia industry on our environment. Now, carbon dioxide from the steam reforming process when we were making syngas is released as greenhouse gases, right? And carbon dioxide is also utilized in urea production. So the amount of greenhouse gases released is reduced. So that's how we combat that. So um, carbon dioxide is actually released, as I said, as a greenhouse gas when we were producing syngas, right? That's where we reacted methane. I hope you're remembering this. <laughs> reacted methane with steam, this is liquid, not liquid water, but gaseous water, right, to form carbon dioxide and the hydrogen gas that we would have needed, you know, as one of the starting products for the HABA process, right? Now, the use of methane and hydrogen pose, pose that should have been posed, pose threats for explosions, seeing that they are, they are highly flammable, right? I, I I had actually thought about this, like they use some of the most flammable stuff 
<laughs> like what going to happen brother if if like some sparks go fly and stuff and you go boom kaboom what going to happen <laughs> you're gonna have like one next chernobyl incident and when used as in fertilizers they can seep into groundwater among with other bodies and fosters eutrophication all right so that's one of the major things so most of you who did um did your carib exam when we were dealing with the coral reef thing i know man, a lot of you studied coral bleaching you you did study coral bleaching so you know how that works and yeah so Fertilizers will seep into groundwater and other water bodies as well. And that will actually cause eutrophication. Now, excess ammonia and fertilizers in the soil can cause soil acidification. And that's a problem as well because not many plants will, will be able to grow in acidified soil. What's next? Okay, the contact process. And we're not doing that. So that's where the transition was. My my peer and I did ammonia and um, the, 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 the contact process. There was a quiz at the end as well, but that had, that was for like, let me go down to it. That had um, contact process questions as, as well as um, the, the ammonia questions. But let's go back to this where I have the ammonia questions and hopefully I can answer the questions. <laughs> that would be very embarrassing if I can't because I got so excited. All right, so the Haber process for the industrial manufacture of ammonia involves processes of distillation, compression, catalysis, condensation, and um, recycling. So identify the steps in production of each of the following processes um is relevant um guys please help me out so distillation that's where we got nitrogen right remember nitrogen from the fractional distillation of air right um compression compression was where the starting materials were compressed to make liquid ammonia. That was when we were in the the react. We were compressing to send them to the reactor. So I guess you'd say that. Listen, ammonia. <laughs> ammonia was at NH three. Catalysis. Um. The nickel oxide catalyst was added to produce more hydrogen. I think I said that. And also the Fe catalyst, the iron catalyst that is, it's the same thing, was used to, um, what was it used to? Speed up the reaction in the Haber process, right? Now condensation, where did that happen? I don't even know. I know where recycling happened though. In the reactor, where um, when um, the unused nitrogen and what, hydrogen, that, that weren't actually um, made into ammonia when the compression happened was sent back to the reactor when, you know, tapped off to um, go through the entire process again. Condensation. I want to say that's where um, I know two instances of condensation. Condensation when um, the air was made liquid when we reduced the temperature to minus 200 degrees Celsius. Remember when we went to O2, I say this like we are actually playing the game. When we went to O2 and we filtered the air and we compressed the 
we actually added pressure and reduced the temperature to make the air liquid for fractional distillation. That was, a, that was an instance of condensation. And also another instance where condensation occurred was when we compressed the, um, the, the starting materials, nitrogen and hydrogen, and sent them to the reactor to be tapped off because we made them liquid there as well, right? So I'll wait till you guys, someone, you know, comments about that. <laughs> But yeah, now the raw materials used to obtain the elements, nitrogen and hydrogen for the industrial synthesis of ammonia are obtained from varied sources. Now the industrial synthesis provides ammonia that is subsequently used in the manufacture of nitrogen-based commercial products. Now figure one below shows a flow diagram. It's not below because the page is small, so I put it beside it. So um, <clears throat> shows a flow chart of a general scheme for the industrial production of ammonia. Now, here we have steam and H2O. So that's where we did, we did the part where we were talking about the, the production of syngas, right? By reacting CH4 with H2O, which is, and we produced <clears throat> carbon dioxide and H2 gas but they only showed H2 as the product, the product here because that's the starting material we need. So here they say identify source A and the process I used to obtain nitrogen gas. All right, <clears throat> sorry, give me a second. All right, great. So source A is here. <laughs> because that's where we got it, got nitrogen from, and I, the process, should have said process I, what I said I process, is fractional distillation. And answer along with me, guys, because that probably will help you to remember. Now, suggest so another condition required at uh, process two, which um, which is used to yield hydrogen gas. So suggest another condition required at process two that, um, oh, oh, they said high temperature. I was wondering what they're talking about, you know. High temperature, was the pressure also high? Let's look. I think it was 1,100. That, no, that wasn't it. Let me not. Let me not. I can't believe this. I just did this just now. It's 20 atmospheres. That's like 20 times atmospheric pressure. So high pressure. So high pressure. No, write a balanced equation for the reaction. Which reaction? This one, CH4. So CH4 plus H2O will give us C carbon. Is it carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide? I think it's carbon dioxide and H2 gas. Right? No, four, five, four, five, six, three, two, six hydrogens, yeah, I think it's carbon monoxide, not carbon dioxide. Yeah, and then it would be balanced. I remember the three H2 because that's what's used in the, the what you call it? That's used in the Haber process. I was like, oh, it actually comes out how it's supposed to. So carbon monoxide and three H's, and that's that. Um, identify the conditions at three that maximizes the time taken to produce a batch of ammonia from the starting material. So the condition at three, I don't, I don't, to maximize the time taken or minimize, it's, I am the one who is acting like a, a dud, like I'm simple. So the, the, oh, so minimize the time. So that would, 
mean the time it happens in a shorter time so that means faster so think catalyst so the fe catalyst or the iron catalyst um give a reason for your answer what the catalyst does is it reduces the activation energy of the overall or oh yeah all right use that over the overall reaction and causes it to proceed or take a pathway, take an alternate pathway, pathway, you know, that has blah, 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 that, that um, actually has alternate pathway that requires less energy for the reaction to actually get kick-started. So you'd have more particles in the reaction having the activation energy required to, uh, to allow the reaction to propagate or take place. Yay, great. I'm seeing some answers. Um, yes, as soon as I, um, I end the live, YouTube will do its stuff and then um, it will post on its own. So you'll have it later tonight and tomorrow and forever, I guess. <laughs> so under what conditions would ammonia be held in the storage cylinders? All right, ammonia, storage cylinders. I think it's low temperature. What's A on the diagram? A, 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 A. A is air, as in air we inhale. Yeah, let me write air. I don't know if you're hearing me. I don't want to. I know you're hearing me. I don't know why I keep thinking you guys aren't hearing me. Yeah, but it's air. So under what conditions would ammonia be held in the storage cylinders no ammonia ammonia remember it's um actually being tapped off so you need it to be liquid so it would be lower temperatures and higher temperature higher pressures so that's what i would put um high pressure low temp temperature right and describe a laboratory test that um could be carried out at point X to test for leaks in the the um the storage the storage cylinder the litmus test can use a litmus test no ammonia turns what red litmus blue right Give me a sec. Oh my God, can you stop? So ammonia, yeah, you could use the, the, the litmus, is it litmus or litmus? I think it's a litmus, you know. So ammonia um, turns damp red litmus blue. So it's like, I think they call it lithmus A. All right, so red lithmus turns blue. It said describe, and it's one mark, and I don't understand CXC, but blue. Yeah. Like, I can't change the color, and I don't know why I'm always using blue. Oh, isn't this lovely? I actually duplicated a page. All right. So in 1912, the German chemist Fitzhaber developed a process for synthesizing ammonia directly from nitrogen and hydrogen. A major problem Haber encounters was, en encountered was a decrease in the equilibrium con constant Keq with an increase in 
operating temperature. Now write an equation for the production of ammonia from nitrogen and hydrogen and give one large scale use of ammonia. All right. <laughs> Isn't this lovely? All right, starting materials, nitrogen and hydrogen and two gas. I think it's three H2 gas. It's an equilibrium reaction, right? And ammonia is NH3, right? So we produce two moles and it, yeah, and it amounts to 42. I remember from the PowerPoint, the big four and then two. All right, so that's it. And one large scale use of ammonia, ammonia um, is used in the production of fertilizers, would that be large scale? Anyways, I would have put explosives. That's the first thing that came to my mind. So explosives, explosives for military use, and that sounds very large scale to me. So <laughs> that's what I would have put. But I guess you can put anything you feel like, but just make it, you know, make sure you answer the question. Fertilizers, let's go over that. Fertilizers, livestock feed, then who spoke after that? We had um, we had the Sarge before that. So he was talking about explosives and food during World War I. And after the after after the farmer George, which was the green among us character, we had um, who we had housewife Betty, and she talked about dyes and cleaning products for from Mr. Clean. <laughs> Oh my God, I'm such a dork. The things I get excited over. An increase in the operating temperature resulted in a decrease in the, the equilibrium constant. Now, why is this unacceptable to Haber? All right, what I think is by, all right, we know that it's an equilibrium reaction. So by increasing the temperature, the forward reaction will be, you know, we know that the forward reaction for the um, Haber process is exothermic. So by increasing the temperature, the system will try to combat this and those um, have, you know, we will have a low, 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 low. The temperature will, the system will try to lower the temperature. So the equilibrium will shift to the left, you know, and the backward reaction will be favored. And that would mean that the decrease, there will be a decrease in the yield of ammonia. And we know that this, this equilibrium constant is equal to K, KEQ is equal to the concentration of NH2, NH3, sorry, squared over the concentration of N2 times the concentration of H2 cubed. Like, bro, behave. H2 cubed. So by decreasing, by if this decreases, this decreases, that will be showing us, yes, by increasing the temperature, by increasing, sorry, the, the temperature, that means that these will get bigger, right? Over here, the, N, the concentration of N2 and 3H2 will become bigger and this will become smaller or the yield of ammonia will decrease. So this number will be small divided by a big number and that will equal a big number. Wait, a small number. Isn't my math terrible? So like, let's say the small number up top is one over the big number being two, like that's a half, which is 0 0.5. And you can even, I can show you still, small number one, big number four, that's 0 0.25, that even got even smaller. So that's why it's unacceptable for Haber because for one, the 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 yield of ammonia has drastically decreased and that makes sense like by le chasselier's principle ke and all of that what i just explained make sense if you increase the temperature 
this here, the backward reaction is favored. The equilibrium will shift to the left and that will cause the equilibrium constant to have a small number over a big number, which results in a small equilibrium constant. I thought I wouldn't be able to figure this out. Now explain how liquefying the ammonia as soon as it is made affects the yield of ammonia and state the principle on which the effect is based. would affect the yield. By liquefying ammonia, that means you will increase the pressure. This is all, the, why they ask the questions like this? I'm thinking it, by liquefying ammonia, the pressure in the container will be increased. So by Le Chatelier's principle, so that person, from the Asbol principle, uh, my brain went straight to Le, Chat Le, Chat Le Chatelier's principle, because that's the only principle on the syllabus. <laughs> right? Right? So by, um, by liquefying ammonia, um, the yield will actually, the yield would be increased because you're increasing the pressure, right? <laughs> yeah, I think so. So that's how that would, and the principle is, the principle is Le Chatelier's principle because by increasing the pressure, it will shift to the side with the, the fewer or the less amount of moles. And then that would be this, the forward reaction where more ammonia would be produced. And outline two steps taken by Haber to increase the yield of ammonia and explain how these modifications led to, led to the improvement um, in ammonia production. So as I told you, the temperature is reduced to um, what we call a compromise. And by reducing the temperature, the forward exothermic reaction will be favored and the equilibrium will shift to the right, um, producing more ammonia. And by another thing was high temperature, high pressure, sorry. And by increasing the pressure by Le Chatelier's principle, it will favor the side with the lesser amount of moles and the thus, which would be like, oh my God, don't touch the screen because four and the two, right? would shift to this side with a lesser amount of moles and thus more ammonia will be produced. So that's it. How many of these questions are left? As my mom getting tired and there are not a lot, but a lot. <sighs> State one factor which influences the, the sitting of an ammonia plant. All right, um, things like distance from residential areas, um, closeness to water bodies. <clears throat> what else? Um, factors that influence where you put factories and such. You can't put them in residential areas, can't put them near places like water bodies or um, reserves where you would have like natural nature and animals. I said nature and animals, but I think you get what I'm saying. There are supposedly some more, but let me see them in the comments. So suggest two safety precautions that should, oh, I just had to state one anyways. State two safety precautions that um, should be taken for the protection of the workers in the operation of an ammonia plant. Now, um, Pete, they will be working near high temperatures. So, um, so the proper PPE, that's personal protective equipment is required. So like goggles, coats, gloves, I said coats, but I meant coats, gloves. So let me write that, PPE. I love using this personal protective equipment, equipment. Don't put an S like me. And what else? Um, you, I don't think, I also think that um, the workers will have to be given proper and a work area or workspace with proper ventilation. So that's also important. If you have any more, drop them in the comments or the chat. 
Uh, yeah. If this asks me for this open again, I am definitely not doing it. Ammonia is manufactured from its elements by the Haber process. The process taking place in the reaction chamber is represented by that here equation. <laughs> Congratulations. So identify the source and the process used to produce nitrogen. The, it's the same question. The source is air and the process is fractional distillation. So just state that and you should be able to get your two marks. I haven't been able to look at the student reports and stuff for these questions. So I'm praying to God that they're correct. Hydrogen is obtained from natural gas by reaction with steam, right? State the name of this um, process. It's called steam reformation or I think uh, syngas production, yeah. And then all right, steam reformation. Um, right, the equation for this, for its production. So CH4 for methane plus H2O. And remember that your state symbols, I always preach this like when I'm tutoring, I'm like, Child, remember the state symbols. Don't forget them, right? So yeah, H2O gas. And that will give us carbon monoxide, great. And that's a gas as well, and the three H2 gas. And that's your equation. Cha -la -la -la. Where did I hear that? All right, using Le Chatelier's principle, describe the conditions under which optimum yields of ammonia can be obtained. <sighs> High pressure. I'm not going to stress this again. High pressure. So favors side with lesser or fewer amount of moles or number. I should always say number and because I can't count them. Number of moles, that kind of confusing me because I don't know if I should think about moles as 1.6, 1.62. I should be ashamed. It's 1.06. I know so many constants. God. Um, I'll remember that in a second. But um, low temperature. It's soon nine o'clock. Oh my God, well, we'll be done in a few, I promise. I'll be done in a few. A low temperature now fa um, favors the forward reaction or the forward reaction will be favored, which is exothermic. So um, yield of ammonia increases. Now account for the differences between the conditions of above um, um, of C above with those used in the Haber process. Account for the differences between the conditions of C above and those used in the Haber process. I'm guessing they mean like in actual, in the actual um, labs or industrial production, um, getting stuff at high temperature as high at the high temperatures um, stated is quite expensive. So in reality, even though these would be ideal for the production of ammonia, they don't really, they don't um, constantly use those or yeah, they don't constantly use those because of expenses and stuff. So I'm wondering if that's what they mean by the differences in conditions used above versus the Haber process because that's the Haber process. That question kind of sound kind of funny. Oh, kind of sound kind of funny. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, so that's what I think expenses and um, safe health, um, health and safety risks. Ammonia is manufactured from its elements by the Haber process, right? The equation for the process and for the millionth time I will write it. What is it what? Oh my God, and I still have trouble writing it and that's the problem. Look at me writing foolishness though. Gas plus um, hydrogen, it's three, right? Three hydrogen gas. Like if you're writing in the chat, I'll see. 
yeah too high of a pressure will cause an increase in energy to power the compressor which is expensive that's that's great yeah um where am i <laughs> okay yeah so this would produce ammonia which is nh3 right and i think it's two moles and that's it indicate the conditions of pressure temperature and pressure high tem low temperature my god there isn't anything else to low temp and high pressure high pressure pressure all right state the process by which nitrogen is produced for the production of um, ammonia the process it's obtained through fractional distillation of air Oh my God, there is an, an ethanol question that I remember doing on my exam that I didn't, I couldn't find. State two factors, my mock exam that is, state two factors which should increase the low influence, the location of an ammonia in um, industrial plant, um, distance from residential areas. Um, distance from, I think these were, these are my go-to answers. <laughs> distance from water bodies. I'll, I'll think, I think in the morning, I'll just Google something and get like two other stuff, or I'll just do them after this and just drop them in the comments and pin them for y'all. All right, with reference to Le Chatelier's principle, ex I, I, um, explain the effect on the yield of ammonia by raising the temperature. Again, in raising the temperature reduces reduces the yield of ammonia because the forward reaction is exothermic. So by Le Chatelier's principle, if you raise the temperature, the system will try to combat it by trying to lower its temperature. So that means that the endothermic reaction will be favored, which is the backward reaction or the reversed reaction, right? And that's why, so the equilibrium will shift to the left and thus the, the yield of ammonia is reduced by raising the pressure. However, um, the yield of ammonia is increased. Ah, uh, makes sense? Because uh, by Le Chatelier's principle, the side with the, um, the lesser or the fewer number of moles will be favored and that would be the side with ammonia. So the yield of ammonia will increase seeing that the equilibrium will shift to the right and the forward reaction will be favored. Oh my God. <laughs> okay, this is the last question. Great, 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 great. Figure two is a flow diagram showing the manufacture of ammonia which involves a number of experimental processes, including A, B, C, and D. Why? Identify the processes occurring at A, B, C, A, B, and D, sorry. Is it A? All right. Um, steam reformation or the steam reform process. Um, B, this is where we have N2, H2, N2, H2, and the carbon monoxide. And then through B, we have N2. I think that's the compressor or not, or is it D? I think D would be the reactor where you top off, where you'd have the thing you topped off, yeah. Where you'd have ammo liquid ammonia topped off. Yes, because here we have ammonia, N2 and H2, and the the one, the thing that's not topped, that's not what, that's not used or did not make ammonia will be recycled. And so here the heat exchanger, like a me alone miss all of this. Up here, 
we have the storage cylinders. But I'm wondering, would it be B or C? Would this or D? Is the is the reactor the storage cylinder or what? I honestly don't know. <laughs> Um, all right, let's go through the process. Shift reactor B, what happens? The N2, H2, B, what happens? Where did the CO2 go? All right, conditions necessary at C. At C, I know that's definitely high pressure. And what is the physical state of ammonia after the process at D? It's liquid, right? So that's an easy one too. But what is happening? What's, all right, at A, I can put in the answer for that because it's the steam reform process, right? B on the hot, hotter, hotter hand. Can't. I am at this, at this moment. At this moment, I am tired. So any laps in where I go on, it just I go on. <laughs> Other. All right, like guys, I'm fine. I, I'm off, I'm off in this because I don't know. I'll ask my teacher about B and D and I'll just drop it in the comments. But all the best on your exams and I guess I'll um like message me if you have any questions i'll try to answer them probably not tonight <laughs> at the the carbon dioxide is absorbed because it can poison the oh yes we did that i took didn't i say that yes thank you that makes sense so um what would we say all right you know what find some where identify the process. Does the process have a um something there? The name did I say something there? All right. Obtain the gas purify purification of um the gases, I guess. Purification of the gases. That makes sense. That's great. And that D. Um, I want to say the tapping off of ammonia. Um, um, I would say the release, the release of liquid ammonia. Yeah. So that was the last question, guys. So you know the drill. If you haven't, if you know you're here sitting here and you have not hit that subscribe button, hit it and turn on your post notifications so that you know every time I post and remember that I have a summer filled with content for you all. So please go over to my Instagram pages. I'll have them in the description below, I guess, or you can just go on my main page for the for this channel and you'll find both my Instagram pages. Just go there and follow me. I'll follow you back on my personal page at underscore C-A-M underscore E-O. My name is Kamuli, by the way. <laughs> yeah, drop a like on this video as well and show me some love. I, I As usual, um, the condensation, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you, love. Look at us making strides. Very good. Great. So um, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> oh my god. Um, so I told you to subscribe. I told you to like the video. Turn on your post notifications. Hit me up. Oh, my name is Camille. By the way, yeah, I did that. <laughs> and I guess that would have been it. So um, um. I have to apologize again for the late, <laughs> the late start, but um, it wasn't really a planned thing, just that you guys asked me to do it. So I just tried to prepare myself for it. And I wanted to ensure that I knew enough about the content before, you know, I came and wasted you guys time. So I didn't want to do that. So that's why I started late. So please forgive me for that. But 
the video had actually dropped. I didn't know that I would have finished it. So I guess enjoy the rest of your night, get some rest and, you know, get ready for your exams tomorrow. And thank you for being here. Bye-bye, guys.